time to time. And each story could spark a memory for you that you can share with the people that you love. Hear The Appleseed every Thursday at noon, right here on the information and cultural beacon of the Four Corners, KSJE, Farmington, New Mexico. Ten minutes past eight o'clock. It is Thursday morning, the third day of August, 2023. Good morning, everyone. I'm Scott Micklin. Thanks for tuning in to KSJE 90.9 FM over the air right here in San Juan County, New Mexico. In Durango, Colorado, we broadcast, of course, at 103.3 FM. And if you'd like to listen to us anywhere else on the planet, just go to our website, ksje.com. We are streaming 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days a year. Good to see you, everyone. Good to have you with us as well. To our viewers who are joining us this morning, of course, this program is streaming out to the KSJE Facebook page and our YouTube channel, so we welcome everyone to the program today. Coming up in the next few moments, my guest this morning, local archaeologist Paul Reed is with me. He works, of course, with Salmon Ruins and Archaeology Southwest, and this morning, a special guest uh, is joining us as well, talking about her really interesting research into color and pigments and paint at Chaco Canyon and other places around the Southwest. That conversation begins in the next few moments right here on KSJE This Morning. Next hour, Mick Hess is going to take us roving with the arts. It is our weekday classical music program, so we hope you'll stay tuned for that coming up today at 9.06 a.m. on KSJE. We also invite you to connect with us on Twitter, or what used to be called Twitter, it's now X, or on our Instagram page as well. And, of course, if you're a podcast person, you can find and listen to KSJE Podcast for free wherever you listen to podcasts, places like iTunes and Spotify and iHeartRadio and Google Podcasts and Pandora. Uh, the list goes on and on. Just search for KSJE and maybe discover a new local program that you may have missed. Outside our studios here at San Juan College, it is currently a sunny Thursday morning. Current temperature 65 degrees at the moment. We're expecting a sunny day today with a high reaching 90 this afternoon. Clear tonight with a low of 61. Sunny and 94 for high tomorrow. 95 on Saturday. 96 with sunshine on Sunday. Cooling off again to 94 with sunshine on Monday, but highs right around that mid-90 to mid mark for the next several days. Back with my guests with more right after this. KSJE is supported by San Juan Regional Medical Center. The caregivers of San Juan Regional Medical Center are committed to bettering the quality of life, health, and care of individuals, families, and our communities. Life is their sacred trust. Better is their mission. Here is their home. San Juan Regional Medical Center, improving the health of the Four Corners since 1910. Live streaming of the 2023 Connie Mack World Series and other KSJE programs is provided by PESCO. For over 50 years, PESCO has been actively involved in San Juan County, and we will continue to do so for the next 50 years and beyond. PESCO has supported youth sports, including the Connie Mack World Series, for years. This world-class event brings baseball's finest athletes to Farmington, and we look forward to another competitive tournament. Back down from Studio A, and my guest this morning, as I mentioned on the program, Paul Reed is back for his regular visit with me. And Paul, good morning. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining me this morning. Good morning, Scott. Very glad to be back on with you. Right. Great to see you. And uh, you brought a special guest with you this morning who I also want to introduce, and that is... Uh, Get my notes here. Sorry, Kelsey Hansen. Pardon me, Kelsey. And uh, Kelsey is a PhD uh, student at uh, candidate at the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona, who is joining us from Tucson this morning. And Kelsey, good morning to you. It's great to see you as well. Thank you. Hi, Scott. Really nice to be here. Thank you very much. And I want to point out that your work, some of your research um, into pigments and colors, um, is funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, PEO Scholar Award, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Society for American Archaeology, plus other regional organizations who are all helping you to do your work, which you're going to talk about this morning with us. So I'm thrilled about that. So thank you for being here once again. 
Let's begin by talking a bit about um, your work, Kelsey, if you wouldn't mind. And it's really all about the study at Chaco Canyon and some of the colors that were found there and pigments and things along that line and how that, um, how that fits into the rest of what we know about what went on at Chaco. Is that kind of how we get started here? That's a great place to get started, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I specialize in, in paint technology, in the archeology span of color or how people uh, express themselves through color, how they create color from the natural landscape, um, the technologies behind it, and then some of the social processes in terms of how that production and display is ultimately organized. Um, and to me, paint is actually is just like such an interesting material to use to look at people through time because uh, paint is actually one of the oldest technologies that we have um, as humans. So some of the oldest uh, ochre processing mines right now currently dated about 500,000 years old. So when you're looking at kind of a human evolutionary scale here, that's literally when we become human. That's when we diverge from homo, our homo erectus uh, ancestors is at that same time is when we're also starting to experiment with color. Um, so as a material, as from an archaeological, archaeological perspective, paints and pigments become one of the only materials that we've had since day one. So if you're looking at a technology to kind of compare through time, paint's actually a really good one. So I've been working with uh, the archaeological study of, of pigments through training in conservation science and anthropology, archaeology, um, et cetera, for many years now. And yeah, I do specialize specifically in Chaco and uses of paints and pigments because they're pretty abundant. And that's a good place to start when you're looking for a dissertation. Right, so. right. But, and, but it's not unique, to, of course, to Chaco or that culture, right? Paint and pigments have been used worldwide as as humans developed and, and learned more about their environment and then the technology evolved and things along that line. We see it in lots of other places as, as well, but maybe used in a different way with a different meaning. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, uh, so much, there's been so much energy put into understanding that story, the story of um, uh, how people express themselves, the technologies of color. Um, and for a long time, those, those stories were and are very Eurocentric. You could fill an entire library with answers to those questions that come from a strictly European perspective. What happens when you know, scientists and artists team up and look for new materials together? So that story, is not a new one or a, that that story is not a new one but it is again quite limited because we have an entire world and you know hundreds of thousands of years of alternatives and other stories so uh chaco is but one piece in a really a truly global story of um expression and experimentation and um and so on so my component my contribution to this is really quite small in the grand stories of things um, but I think it's an important example of how diverse these stories can be. Um, so, right. And I was going to say, I think I think your work is helping to fill in some of the blanks to that story. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. Yeah. And Paul Reed, let me bring you into the conversation here about Kelsey's work at Chaco and, and other places. I mean, again, we know a lot. We think we know a lot. You you think we know a lot. You've told me that um, over the over the past few shows that we have done, of course, many shows. Um, but there are still blanks that we don't know about um, what went on maybe at, at Chaco. And, and maybe some of uh, Kelsey's work is helping to fill in some of the blanks and, uh, and explain a bit more of how these paints and colors were used um, in everyday life at Chaco. Yeah, absolutely, Scott. You know, um, we we do sort of know what we think we know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sounds a little vague, right? But um, none of us were there in the past. You know, go ahead and call me Captain Obvious. But um, so we use all these different tools, of course, in archaeology to get a better understanding of how people behaved in the past. And and that's one of the things that I think is particularly fascinating about Kelsey's research because you know color surrounds us today. You know, we. We, many of us are very interested in color. You know, we, we, we explore color with the clothes we wear, the foods we eat, pretty much every aspect of our lives. Um, so for an archaeologist to take this on as a study is particularly fascinating, especially in light of the fact that a lot of what archaeologists do and what we study in the past 
are the objects that survive hundreds and thousands of years of exposure, right? So pigment is a relatively rare thing to find in archaeological sites. We hardly ever find it on the surface of an archaeological place or an historic site unless it's, you know, well painted on to fired ceramics, et cetera. So to have discovered as much pigment as came out of the work at Popo Benito, for example, is just phenomenal. The other thing we know is that color symbolism is very, very important to, you know, human groups across the planet through time and space. So sort of decoding what those different colors mean to one group versus another and understanding perhaps how that changed through time, the significance is again, I think, one of the most fascinating parts of the research. Right. Thank you. And and Kelsey, when we're talking about paint, um, there's kind of three components at least to it to make it work the way it's supposed to work. Right. Uh, I know you were talking and, and sent me some information about you know pigment vehicle and, and binders and how all that works together. Right. To to leave it there for future generations to to be able to see it and study it. That's right. That's right. Um, a paint is really the come if you're really breaking it down it's it's three ingredients you can't just take any rock rub it on a wall add some water and hope for the best it's not going to last very long if you want a durable paint if you want that color to last as it has for again hundreds of thousands of years um you really need three ingredients so uh it's a pigment a binder and a vehicle and so the pigment is this colorful, this is the colorful material. This is the, what you think of when you think of paint. Um, that's something that's ground down. We're talking minerals. What I'm not talking about are dyes. The so dyes are just are truly a categorically different product. When you make a paint, you're mixing the pigment and a, and a binder and everything so that it lays on a surface, whereas a dye is what you're, you're really chemically altering the thing you're coloring. So that's a topic for a different conversation, okay. honestly, because it doesn't preserve as well. Um, but again, paint, so you have something colorful, but in order to make that pigment that you've spent so much time grind, finding and grinding and washing and, and preparing to make that pigment stick to where it's going, you need to add something organic, something, a binder to make it stick. Again, if you were to take any powder and, and add some liquid and spread it somewhere and hope for the best, as soon as that liquid's gone, your pigment's gone. So, um, there are a lot of options for what these binders can look like. Anything from uh, uh, gum arabic is a common one in, in modern times, but gums and resins, um, animal fat, the so waxes, um, chewed seeds, um, all this type of, all these options exist to make this work. And then the vehicle is just that liquid component that helps make it flow. So you can control it and apply it, um, so you can put it somewhere. Right. And I yeah. imagine there was a lot of trial and error to get the right mix of all these things, right, over over history? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And in, in some cases, uh, that experimentation, you know, I, I would say I think that experimentation is a little harder to explore archaeologically because generally speaking, if it didn't work, it probably didn't preserve very well. So right. I'm mostly looking at success stories. Um, but that said, maybe it's an important point to bring up that, you know, the, the what, the stuff of my research it includes anything from the kind of raw materials for making paint so archaeological collections of pigments and and grinding tools that have residues uh adhering to them still uh and then the painted media uh sometimes we have things like paint brushes and and those are much more rare but they exist and so understanding the recipes at every stage gives a, a offers a way to reconstruct the path of production a little bit, um, but the experimentation part can be a little tricky. <laughs> right, right. And Paul Reed, as we talk a little bit about what Kelsey has found at Chaco Canyon, there's evidence of similar, I guess, colors, uh, pigments, designs at other structures and other sites uh, in the greater Chaco um, system. Right, definitely. So, you know, with, with the work that folks did at Salm and Pueblo in the 1970s and the project that I was fortunate to be involved in to sort of help wrap that up. Lots and lots of pigment in different settings, um, you know, red producing pigments, um, different types of malachite and azurite to get blues and turquoises, um, yellow producing ones, um, you know, jet and other really hard black minerals that give black pigments, you know, as well as sort of in the organic realm, Kelsey was talking about binders. 
a lot of times for pottery, people would use what we describe as carbon-based or organic paint, which a lot of times is just cooking down beeweed to a real thick, sticky paste. And again, through this process of trial and experimentation that we're talking about, groups figured out they could paint that on to pottery, fire it at the right temperature, and then it's, it's going to adhere. So yeah, it's we, we get these amazing insights and a lot of time, it, a lot of the time, it takes you know really deeply buried sites or sites in caves or rock shelters, in order for these pigments, especially on more perishable materials, to actually survive and, and make it into the archaeological record. So yeah, um, we've got a really rich record in the Four Corners, really, and across the Southwest, of different places where people are able to do work and then recover, you know, just this broad range, many, many colors of pigments. Right. And so, uh, Kelsey, your work primarily at uh, Pueblo Bonito at Chaco Canyon, which I guess gives you a lot of rooms to uh, to look at and and study, correct? And is that's kind of where your focus has been in your research? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's uh, a wealth of, of material to work from, from Pueblo Bonito alone. Um, that said, I've been working with um, trying to get an understanding of as much of the Chaco world as I can within reason. So to be fair, most of that has been working with the collections from um, Chaco sites in Chaco Canyon. So mm -hmm. I also have major collections from uh, Pueblo Alto, Tetro Kettle, um, all these other great houses as well, as well as some of the small houses, some of the small sites that don't get quite as much attention as the great houses that, you know, the big monumental architecture, but a lot of pigment processing was also happening at some of these smaller sites in the canyon as well. So I'm also working to understand those relationships both within the canyon and hopefully, you know, with a few major nodes outside of the canyon trying to understand um, broader patterns too. So I've also had some questions from um, Aztec and, and Salmon as well. So again, trying to look at um, how traditions shift through time and space too. Right. And, and from the research that you shared, you found as many as, what, five different unique colors, pigments at uh, Chaco Canyon, or at least at Pueblo Bonito? Uh, yeah, I, I would, I would uh, dissolve a lot of the variation in them into about six different colors. So red, yellow, uh, black, white, um, what else? some sparkling pigments are also really important. We're the... Uh, many Western color terms don't include you know, other qualities beyond hue, but in a lot of public communities, it is important to include things that are sparkling. Because um, what Paul mentioned earlier is the relationship between color and, say, cardinal direction and this, this, all this symbolism that is embedded in the way color is used and understood in many indigenous communities, especially in the public world. Right. So, and there's One a, thing that's quite interesting and important to keep in mind when an archaeologist goes to look at collections is that my ideas of what colors are may be different than the people who inhabited these spaces. So it does require a lot of um, kind of backing up and, and asking people and talking to people about what, what is important, what colors are here. <laughs> sure. And it, so we've got yellow, blue, green, red, white, and sparkling and black. Yeah is what you're describing. And then when we look at a map of, of Pueblo Bonito, they are these colors are located really throughout the structure, it looks to me. Yes, absolutely. And so one thing that I um, really have loved about some of the research that I've been doing lately is, so one thing I wanted to do very early on was I wanted to figure out which rooms they were all in, put them on a map and see what happened. You know, are all of the pigments kind of concentrated in certain spaces? Or, certain people owning pigments and some aren't, are they concentrated in certain spaces or not? And one thing that is really, really striking about looking like looking at a map um, like this is just what I've, what we've been talking about is this like visual chaos <laughs> of it. Like it is truly everywhere. Um, rooms that were excavated well enough to have records so we know that there's something from them, they got pigments, you know, in small amounts. And so, uh, this map, for example, is not um, is intentionally very relative to so the size of the dot is just corresponds with amount, you know, so sure. it's, it's not a I'm not trying to communicate hard numbers here, but just generally speaking, more is found with big dots and less with with smaller dots. And, you know, in talking with some of my colleagues uh, from the Pueblo of Zuni, one of the when I was talking about, so what, what, are, what are we looking at? What do you think? Um, what's going on? 
And the most exciting part about a map like this shows just how uh, how much people participated, how 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 beautiful and dynamic and colorful life was in a place like Chaco Canyon, where today when we visit, there is this grandiose, this, this gravitas of these. Uh, monumental structures, but for the most part, I mean, they're left bare, they're left open, they're excavated extensively. And so today they're empty, but we have these mi reminders, these moments where it's clear that there was a lot going on and life was really vibrant and that it, people were actively participating in this across the community. Right. Have you found evidence of certain colors were in certain rooms, but based on purpose or what the rooms were used for? And of course, we know that over time, rooms maybe had different purposes as well as these structures aged and, and populations shrank and grew and what have you, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I will say that uh, I have a paper that I, I recently published on this exact topic. So um, I was looking at specifically blue-green pigments. And so blue-green, you know, again, talking about differences in color terms, when, when in the sort of Western world we have blue and we have green, and these are separate colors. Um, that distinction is not really meaningful in the Pueblo world, so blue-green is one, one category. Um, but when it comes to making paints, blue-green is kind of an interesting one because, first of all, it's a very important color. It's often used to express or connotate or, or affects things like moisture and vegetation. It's, it carries a lot of symbolic weight. But then when it comes to actually, again, making a paint, the technology part of it, it's not that easy to do. So you have to get good materials, you have to grind them just the right way, because if you grind them too fine, the, the, the color becomes very pale. So if you want it to be a nice green color, you've got to keep it coarse enough that it's still bright, but fine enough that it, it works. So the technology of it, different than other pigments. Um, and I'll also say too that while paints can be used in many contexts, so we've talked a little bit about pottery, things like this, um, pigments have a lot of different uses. So when I encounter, say, red ochre, for example, I want to think that it's a paint. I want to think of it as a pigment. But it's really important to remember that some pigments have uh, many different purposes. So red ochre, for example, throughout time and space has been used for many, many things like um, processing hides or as sunscreen or um, as medicine. So like these pigments might not always be uh, used as paint or intended to be used as paint. Blue-green is different though because it doesn't have that like myriad of uses. So when you find these kind of uh, blue and green colorants, you've got a pretty good idea you're looking at a paint. And what's interesting to me is in terms of uh, the distribution of blue-green in places like Pueblo Benito is it does seem like it's quite um, restricted to areas that are, I would say, special. <laughs> so um, usually they're in rooms that articulate with plaza space in kind of um, symbolically charged ways. They're rooms that articulate with the plaza with um, a T-shaped door, with, with something that marks that, that transition from public to private in a recognizably important way. So it does seem like certain paints are being prepared in special places. Got you. And Paul Reed, back to you a little bit about this research and does it, again, um, help you with some of the other work that you do at these other sites to be able to maybe interpret more of what you're seeing and maybe more of what a room was, was used for at some point in its history based on the colors that you find there? Yeah, it definitely does. And you know, I, I, I think what Kelsey said about the vibrancy of the use of color in Pueblo Benito, the fact that there is a lot of color, different colors in different places. I think this, this, this is a great reminder for us to think about just the richness of life in, in the ancient past at Pueblo Benito and at many other sites, you know, across the Southwest. You know, so a lot of times, you know, as Kelsey mentioned, we go in these places now, there are rooms, there's very impressive architecture. Obviously, the roofs are not on, you know, and they've gone through this process of evolution with some decay, obviously, from their use many hundreds of years ago. So this kind of research, I think, does help us remember that the sites were populated by many, many people who were living their lives and doing all the things that were important to those lives. You know, the use of color, 
you know, what they were doing daily to prepare food, take care of their children, interact with other community members. So um, sometimes I think archaeology gets a little, you know, we focus on, we joke about the stones and bones and, and you know, the, the piece of pottery on the ground. Well, that's probably 90% of what archaeologists deal with really anywhere, because those are those really durable material remains. You know, when the winds and the water come through, people leave areas, they're depopulated. We don't see a whole lot of that richness. So what we do get from places like Bobo Benito and Solomon and Aztec is a much richer picture of the way people live their lives with the vibrancy of color. And, and for me, that actually gets me, as I'm thinking about this, as an archaeologist and just as a human being, much closer to understanding, you know, everyone in the past as people. So for me, that's, that's a huge part of it, um, is to have that, that very human connection. Right. Thank you. And uh, Kelsey, can you talk to us a little bit about the types of the color on the in these in these rooms? I mean, I would assume they're not painting entire walls with these colors, but uh, what what were the colors like in these spaces that you found them? Or were they just little designs or a pattern or a, a band or something? Or maybe describe that to us. Right, right. So I will say that uh, the like kind of types of painted media that survive in places like Pablo Benito, it's not an enormous amount of, of, of things. And, and wall painting specifically, unfortunately, there are, we don't have the, we don't have them available to study today, I will mm -hmm. say. So there are some like field sketches of things like, oh, there was something, but as soon as we excavated it, it went away. So now today we have very different ways of um, consolidating and conserving uh, paintings and wall surfaces and fragile things as they're being excavated, but that wasn't the case when these places were excavated. So some of the things are just not available for study. Um, but for the most part, what I, for the most part, what I'm looking at are the building blocks of, of making paint. So pigments, uh, the raw materials, the tools, and some examples of painted media. And most of this, um, when it exists, it's quite fragmentary, but things like painted wood, or um, in some cases, there are tiny, I will say there are tiny fragments of uh, like mural fragments that have fallen off that were collected. Um, so some things like this. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a grab bag of what is available to to look at, to be quite honest. Got you. I understand. And and uh, maybe final question for you, Kelsey, would be, uh, and I asked you this before we came on the other this morning too, because I was curious about it. Is there anything about, you know, paint and, and colors and wealth or class systems? We don't always hear about that at, at Chaco, and maybe that's not right. because it's not a really big deal. It was a more communal, um, experience, but is there anything yeah. in your research that maybe shows any type of different colors meant different status in, the, in a society? Right, right. It's, it's a really, really good question and literally one that I, that I thought of when I was developing this research, right? When I was starting to think about what paint meant in the Pueblo world, in the Chaco world, I was looking towards uh, how it's used today and, and in, you know, the recent past in the Pueblo world. And today, as in the past, presumably, pigments, the, the knowledge for how to create good paint is something that is maintained in very structured ways. Um, and one thing that's quite interesting about Pueblo social organization in general is that unlike, um, you know, a, a Western perspective of what power looks like when power is wealth and it's, it's you know, it's all, it's this material accumulation. So, I was really interested to say, well, well, first of all, so we have that contrast, and then in co the, in many public communities, it's it's not about the accumulation of wealth, but about knowledge. Knowledge becomes one of the most important uh, knowledge and relationships, or it's like two key components that make up your place in this world. And so I was really interested in how that might translate to pigments, because today and in the past, um, the knowledge to create these good paints that, that in the places that they are from, the technology to make them, how to prop appropriately apply them. These are things that are maintained by uh, specific groups of people in the public world. So I was interested in like, well, has that always been the case? Have we always had these kind of um, corporate ownership of, of recipes or knowledge or sources? And what I think is really, really interesting about where 
this research is, is going so far is that it doesn't really seem that way. It really seems like it's not a consolidated one person owns it all or, or something like this. It really seems like everybody was participating. Um, and of course, some of those questions are still unanswered because the research is ongoing, the analysis is still going in terms of understanding more about what these paints are actually made of. However, right now anyway, again, the map that we were showing earlier, or I don't know if it's still up, um, of just how many pigments are found in a place like Pueblo Benito. It is, to me, uh, really important that they're everywhere. It's really important that they're not consolidated in one space that would suggest one owner or something. Um, and I think this really points to the diversity of the communities who lived here and um, continues to show that these places were vibrant, colorful, and, and um, a lot more than meets the eye, I will say. Right. Right. Paul Reed, um, final question to you a little bit about what we're learning about color and, and how this, again, appears distributed throughout uh, Pueblo Bonito here at, at Chaco, but it goes along with, I think, what, what you have been talking about and, and with us over the years, that uh, it was kind of an all-for-one, one-for-all society, that everyone does well when a few people do well and things along that line? Yeah, I think so, Scott. You know, I think um, what Kelsey was just talking about really for me reinforces the idea that, you know, with whatever models we come up with for Chaco, you know, Pueblo people, you know, the Pueblo folks I know and have interacted with in the present, and as we look into the past and other places where folks live, the sense of community is the overriding important thing here. Um, and that's something that, you know, I've talked to a lot about um, an individual we had on the show, Scott. Um, a Zuni man um, named Octavia Saotewa, who Kelsey has also worked with on her projects, um, you know, probably good fodder for a future show in discussion. But, you know, what Octavius has really emphasized with me is that, you know, Chaco did have these amazing accomplishments in architecture, people building, connecting their cosmology in a very specific way to landscapes, to sky, to earth. But they weren't doing that in the context of hierarchical models that we might see operating elsewhere in the world. So for Octavius, and I think for modern Pueblo people, it was very much of a community-based way of living and something that they're still doing today. So I think a lot of times, again, if we look at Chaco and we sort of do this notion of this place where people left and it's all mysterious, well, there is some mystery, but there also is very direct continuity from Chaco's ancient past through other places to pueblos like Zuni Acoma, the Hopi Mesas, you know, across the Rio Grande region. So there's a lot, to, there's a great deal of continuity there. And I think that Kelsey's research is really helping us understand that and how color works in that, in that world. Right. Really fascinating. Fascinating. So thank you. And thank you both. Paul Reed, Kelsey Hansen, thank you both for joining me this morning. And Kelsey, uh, best wishes and good luck in your, in your research. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Paul. Great talking with you. We'll visit again next month. My guest this morning with me here on KSJE. Safe, responsible AI brought to you by the AI industry.